I used to work as a third-party contractor in the convention area of the Swan and Dolphin Resort slash Hotel. Sometimes we would have to be there at really odd hours for a convention setup slash teardown. One morning, I was there about 30 minutes before the union laborers, probably around 3.30 a.m.-ish. I also would like to point out that I used a couple of dating apps at the time, Grinder, Scruff, and Growler. The apps I use also have that location indicator that tells you how far away they were. All of a sudden, some guy whose profile was blank except for a blurry close-up of his shirt, collar, and neck started blowing up my phone on two different apps at the same time. I basically replied that I was at work and busy and may be available to possibly chat later. He started sending really creepy messages like, Oh, I see you working. And other semi-stalkerish messages. I shut down the apps. I have a small office located across from one of the convention halls. I holed up in my office and told the union guys to check in with me there when they arrived. Once they got there, I felt more safe, so I set up my desk out on the convention hall's floor and just continued with my work. Around noon, I launched up the apps again to pass time during my lunch break. As if he had been waiting for this moment, he started chatting me up again from locations like 200 feet away. I told him he seemed a bit creepy and that I wasn't interested. He stopped, or so I thought. A few weeks later, I had a late night tear down around 10 p.m. ish. As soon as I got to my office, he appeared again and started messaging me. His messages didn't seem creepy at first. Just simple things like, Hey, how are you? You busy? I got really creeped out and blocked him. He would then just create new profiles and continue to message me for months. The messages quickly transitioned after the first time I blocked him. He switched to saying things like, You can't block me every time. I know where you work so I can find you again. Why won't you answer me? I deserve an answer. Later, he would just send creepy messages like, I found you again. It looks like you're working hard. Are you alone right now? I always believed in the don't feed the trolls adage and refused to engage with him, blocking him every time. He would generally only message me when I was working very early or very late with occasional day messages while I was working the convention center floor. Convention centers are giant, wide open spaces when no events are going on, which can really add to the creepiness. But what's worse is when there were events happening. I, I mean, the floor is crowded with people. Hundreds, if not thousands of people, all of which could be this odd mystery man. I never really felt safe, but I can't describe the heart-sinking feeling I had when, in late July, he sent me the final messages that sent me to report him to hotel security and my own company seeking help. Here's where the unexplained part comes in for me. After putting up with this for a long time, he ended it abruptly by sending me photos of me at my desk in my office from the first day he messaged me. Let me describe my office a bit for you. My office is tiny, maybe 30 to 35 square feet. We have two desks set up on one side with computers and an empty table in the corner opposite my desk. The rest of the office is filing cabinets and a printer opposite the empty table. The photos seem to be coming from a part of the office where we have the extra table. It's generally an empty table without any electronics on it that we use for anyone visiting the office or to lay out floor plans. I was absolutely freaked out to say the least, but I can't imagine how he had gotten the photos. After turning over the photos, all of the messaging abruptly stopped just as suddenly as it had started. I was a 28-year-old army veteran, and I can honestly say that I wasn't nearly as brave as I thought I would be in a situation like that. In that moment, I turned into a child afraid of letting my feet hang out of the covers for fear that a monster would grab whatever exposed portion he could get a hold of. The thought that a stranger was stalking me from an app is terrifying. But what scares me even more is the possibility that it could have been somebody who I regularly pass by at work. Someone who makes small talk with me and says hi in passing, who then the next minute is sending me anonymous creepy messages. After all, I never did find out who it was, and I guess I'll never know.
This happened in June of 2016. I have celiac disease, a disease where gluten is detected as an allergy and your body attacks itself trying to kill the gluten. Thus, my intestines are extremely damaged and sometimes bloody or infected. The reason I was in the hospital was because of me being a dumbass and eating a bunch of bread. So my intestines got really messed up. Basically, I had to go to the hospital to get some pictures taken of my intestines. This story takes place when they were extremely damaged and bloody. I was spending the night at the hospital with an IV filled with medicine to help me get better quicker or something like that, I don't really remember. The IV was attached to my stomach. I was half asleep and it was around midnight. My dad had left about an hour earlier and I was there all by myself. The hospital has a door with a window and a yellow light from the hallway was preventing me from sleeping. There was a sound of footsteps right by my door and I opened my eyes. I thought it was a nurse or something checking in on me, but it was some guy. He looked like a dad. Middle-aged, glasses, a flannel shirt. He looked really normal. But he wasn't my dad, as my dad is way paunchier and it wasn't a nurse since nurses had their scrubs on at all times. He looked like a visitor. I was a little freaked out, but I wasn't scared yet, as I don't get scared easily. He opened my door very quietly. Hello? I asked, and the guy looked around nervously. He put his finger to his lips in the cartoon famous shh face. His face was stoic and his eyes looked wild. I would have either punched him or ran, but I'm connected to a liquid bag and I have a huge throbbing in my stomach. I had been under an operation of sorts earlier and I was not allowed to get up. I'll be quick, he muttered. He quietly moved around my cot and crouched down. I didn't take my eyes off of him. Then, he fucking unplugged my IV. I was livid and I was terrified. What the fuck did he think he was doing? The IV stopped making the humming sounds as it stopped being run with electricity. These things are not meant to be unplugged. Their plugs are tough so that they don't get unplugged. He then looked at me dead in the face and said, Fuck you. He flipped me off and left without another word. Looking back at it, it's almost kind of funny the way he said it like a teenager flipping off his parent, but at 15 years old, I didn't think that it was funny. I was still in complete shock for three seconds before I screamed bloody murder. A nurse was in my room very quickly after that. I told her what happened and she just stared at me. It wasn't until she noticed he unplugged my IV that she freaked out. She plugged it back in and I remember she stayed with me until either morning or until I fell back asleep. I don't remember what came first. There was a lot of shouting from the hall, and every time I tried to speak up, she shushed me. Eventually, I fell asleep. I wouldn't have told this story if my dad hadn't told me what happened after. Somehow, this story came up recently, and I kinda chuckled about it. My dad was quiet before he asked me if he ever told me about the end of that story. I said no. My dad told me a guy had come into the doctor's office asking to visit his friend who had gone under surgery. They didn't let him in since he was asleep and it was way past visiting hours. This man didn't listen and somehow got past the people at the front desk. They also didn't know that this guy had some kind of knife. He cut four people's medical wires and unplugged my IV. There was also some other guy who was sleeping, and he unplugged that guy's IV too. That guy went into a coma. A, a fucking coma. So, the police caught this guy and put him into a mental hospital. I was shaken. I had really come into contact with a full-on crazy person. What would he have done to me if I had been sleeping? I don't know. Ever since I talked to my dad, I wanted to tell this story. It may not have been very scary to anyone but me, but I was so vulnerable at the time. Who knows what he could have done if I was any more vulnerable. I hope he's getting the care he needs, or something. Like I just said, this might not make any sense or be very scary, but it freaked me the fuck out. I don't have a very strong end or moral to the story, but I don't really trust that hospital anymore. 
Not after some crazy guy sneaks in right under their goddamn noses. Let me set the scene for you. I was seven, and my mother was dating a man with a daughter who was about 15. Her name was Christy. While she didn't live with us, she did stay with us on some weekends. The reason this is important will come into play a little later. I grew up in a moderately isolated area in the south. My mother's house is on about 90 acres, most of it being heavily wooded. For the most part, it was quiet the type of place most people didn't lock their doors and everyone knows each other. It was quiet until one sequence of events shook my community to its core. There was a man just two streets over from mine who murdered his girlfriend's entire family, including her. It was in their home over a dinner about two weeks before this event took place. It was also learned later that he had also murdered his mother and father in their home as they were found after his girlfriend's family was. He hadn't been caught, and the local police were working with police in Tennessee as there had been reportings of people citing him there. My mother had gotten a security system installed just to ensure our home was properly secured. We had alarms on every window and door in our house. On this Saturday, my mother got called into work as she was an apartment manager and there was an emergency that she needed to tend to. Her boyfriend had gone to work early that morning. My mother was very, very nervous about leaving and due to the nature of the emergency, she thought it would be best that Christy and I stay home where we were safe. Safe, so she thought. She reluctantly left and let us know that her cell phone was always going to be on her if we needed her. Christy and I promptly set the alarm and made sure that all the doors were locked. My mother had been gone about an hour and we were deep into a Disney movie and pizza. Suddenly, the alarm started blaring. Christy and I jumped up to see what was going on. On the way to the alarm, you have to pass a very large sliding glass door. What we saw there left us frozen. There was a man prying our door open with a crowbar. He saw us, made eye contact, and quickly ran off into the woods behind my mother's house. I will never forget what he looked like, or the sinister look he had in his eyes. We called the police, and then we called my mother, who had already been alerted by the alarm company. My mother actually arrived before the police did due to how isolated we really were. When we described the man to the police, they immediately knew that it was the man that they were looking for. Of course, there was a massive investigation that day of the property and the woods surrounding us. In the woods, they found cigarette butts, lots of canned food, soda bottles, and a makeshift tent made from a tarp. The man had been living behind us the entire time, and even had been stealing food from our trash. When he was arrested, which was a few hours after the incident, he had admitted to watching our family to learn our habits, knowing that he could take advantage of the house when no one was there. Even now, as an adult, this event still follows me. Just goes to show that you really never know who is watching you. I was backpacking with my friend in the Yukon. We met this dude named Carl in Dawson at a free dinner put on by the town church. He asked my friend and I, both girls, where we were staying. We told him we were backcountry camping to play it safe and then he went on to say that he knew the whole area like the back of his hand. He asked for specifics and we lied and said that we were at the main campsite. We finished our dinner and tried to run out of there, but then he cornered us and offered to give us a ride back to our campsite. Luckily, we had our car, so we said no thanks and tried to make a run for it. We got to our car and started driving down the road to where we were camping. It's the Yukon, there's only a few people driving back and forth, and we took a turn onto a gravel road heading north. We realized that there's been a truck following us since we left town. And we especially notice once we're on this gravel road with absolutely no service and no emergency services. There are literally no turnoffs on this road. And even if there was, we were in prime bear territory next to a river, so running for it wasn't even worth it. My friend decided she was just going to drive faster and try to pull a fast one on Carl. So we blitzed down the gravel road until we hit snow. 
The whole road is covered in snow and ice and we can't go much further in the pace that she's set. We see a campsite ahead of us, blitz it there and park the car on the far side of the road to hopefully confuse the guy. We grab our tents, sleeping bags, food and everything warm within our vicinity and make a run for it. We saw that the campsite had a shelter in the middle. We knew we had to get warm quickly so the game plan was to run to the shelter, get fully dressed and prepare to sleep in a snow embankment. However, once we got to the shelter we bumped into a family of 12 people. Eight men and four women. We ran into the shelter swearing, cursing, and freaking out because we felt that that creepy Carl guy was after us. So once we turned around and saw the faces staring at us in amazement, we calmed down and tried to explain our situation. From the moment we uttered the words, There's a man who has been following us for the last 100 kilometers. Everyone stepped up. The men ran outside with their knives, hiking poles, bear spray, etc and the women took us in and told us to run. They had seen a dense patch of trees in the northeast corner of the campsite, and knew that all of us could hide within the trees without fear of being caught. They even mentioned we could build Quincy's super quickly to hide in, but running further away felt safer. As we ran to safety, we could hear the men yelling and telling Creepy Carl to stay away. There were loud noises, a car alarm, as we knew it was our car, and then complete silence. My friend and I stared at each other with tears in our eyes. We were in the northern part of the Yukon, in the snow, in negative 10 degrees Celsius weather, and we had just been followed from what we thought was just going to be a free dinner from the local church. After 30 minutes, the other women decided that it was time to return to the shelter and to find the men. We returned and found the men safe and sound. Apparently, Creepy Carl had told them that we were none of their business and that we had wronged him in some sort of manner. So he broke our car window and turned around and left. One of the guys had a car, so he had followed Creepy Carl down the road a good 15 or 20 kilometers before turning back around. The women invited my friend and I to sleep in their campsite and we gladly obliged. We woke up the next morning safe and sound in the middle of the Yukon without cell or emergency services, and a giant appreciation for finding other humans. <laughs>